Today, I want to talk about something that has really been um, something I've wanted to talk about for a while, actually, but I just haven't, haven't had the opportunity. Um, so uh, what I'm going to look at today is um, just the, the subject of wholeness. Um, we are really good at teaching people how to look after their spirits. You know, we know that we need worship, that we need um, to read the Bible, we need prayer, um, we need a uh, fellowship, we need to fast to help us develop spiritually, which are all great things. But what we've not been great at doing is uh, teaching people how to look after their souls and their bodies. Uh, and we're triune beings. God made us and loves each of the three parts of us, body, soul, and spirit. So... Um, that's what we're going to do. So um, I love Chuck Parry. He is a guy I met. Um, he works in the healing rooms in Bethel. Um, and I've just recently read his book. And one of the things that he says in it, um, you know, the, the verse that Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. And he decided that he was going to look up all the verses where Jesus uses imperative verbs and basically try and work out what are the things he actually commands. Uh, and he came up with the top three, um, which were repeated between 18 and 28 times. So the third most frequent command that Jesus spoke was fear not, apparently. Uh, the second, believe. And the number one command in frequency of time spoken um, is be made whole or be healed, um, which I think is quite interesting. And uh, so God just really, he created us, he intended us to function in wholeness. And I really believe that it is a priority that he has for our lives. So that's what we're going to look at. So I just want to have a wee look as an intro um, at some of the ways that Jesus did command wholeness. Um, so in Luke uh, 17, um, when Jesus was entering the town, he was met by the lepers. Now, just basically they're outside the town because that's where lepers had uh, to live. Um, so he's met by these 10 lepers. And lepers at the time were basically, when they walked into a public place, they had to shout out, unclean, unclean. Um, and so Jesus um, says to these guys, right, go and show yourselves to the priests. And it's as they go uh, that they get healed. Um, and what I find really interesting, actually, in a Jewish a law, um, they basically, the way that it was in the Bible was that they had to go to the priests to get declared uh, clean. But actually, until this point, or like, you know, for lepers, they hadn't been getting healed until Jesus appeared in the scene. So I just think it's quite interesting that what priests would have been trained in, wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily have had a chance to do until Jesus arrived, which is quite fun. So uh, the leper, we know that um, nine get healed, one comes back, um, and he gets healed in his body, so no leprosy. Um, his soul uh, gets healed, I believe, because he's now going to be able to get physical affection and touch. Um, and we know that Jesus, when he does heal other lepers, he often will touch them. Um, and also the priest, um, the guy didn't make it to the priest yet, but he's gonna, going to go. And basically the priest is the one who is going to allow him back into the temple uh, to worship by declaring him um, clean. Uh, and Jesus says to him, your faith has made you well, which is that word sozo, um, so, so wholeness. Um, and we know that Jesus can speak a word and someone gets healed like the centurion servant. But um, if Jesus does something other than say be healed, it's because um, basically they need more than that to heal them, that there's something else he needs uh, to do. Um, so John 9, the man born blind, uh, the disciples asked Jesus, who sinned, was it this man uh, or was it his parents? And the reason they asked that is because there's the big long list in uh, Deuteronomy 28 of curses of uh, basically being disobedient to God and blindness uh, was one of them. So that would be why they asked the question. Um, and when someone uh, was blind, basically they would walk past them and spit on the person to basically agree that, that this person is cursed. And I'm agreeing with the fact that God's cursed you and so I'm going to spit on you. So what's really great is that Jesus used the very thing um, that was used to curse him to heal this guy because he spat in the mud and he um, got him healed. So the blind man gets healed physically, um, he gets emotionally healed, and he realizes he's not cursed, so he's spiritually uh, set free and, and sorted out too. And then also the woman with the issue of blood, uh, her body, what's really interesting actually, her body gets healed first, and then Jesus says to her, your faith has made you whole, that word sozo again, and then tells her to go in peace. Um, and what's really interesting is that but when he says go in peace, why does he say that? Well, it's because she wasn't in peace. 
And that would have been like one of the root issues, I believe, as to why she, yeah, what was going on with her, which is why Jesus said it. Um, she was unclean. She was forbidden for coming into contact with other people. Um, and so actually she gets made whole. That sows the word again. She gets reintegrated uh, into society. And what's also interesting, um, the word shalom or peace, um, how do we look in, in, in Strong's, some of the definitions for that word are completeness, wholeness, health, prosperity, fullness, rest. So as she went into peace, She's going into wholeness, into health, into prosperity. And um, sometimes we can have a wrong understanding um, of what God uh, thinks about our bodies. Um, so I just want to unpack a few things scripturally for you to start with. So Romans 8, a 6 says that the mind set on the flesh is death. Um, so what flesh is he actually talking about? Uh, well, this is the old man that Paul's talking about. So, you know, like, there's lots of long lists, but, like, the Galatians 5 list, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, all, etc., etc., um, would be old man. That is what um, the mind uh, basically set on, on that type of flesh is death. Um, but we became new creations when we got baptized in the water of baptism. That old man is dead, thank goodness. Um, and so we are new. And so Romans 8, 11 tells us that this spirit gives life to our mortal bodies. And in Ephesians 5, 28, I just love this, it says, In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Um, So yeah, I I think sometimes we can have a completely wrong idea about what uh, God thinks um, about our body. Sometimes even just the way things, people, their lens or perspective on scripture. So in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus said, the spirit is willing, um, but the flesh is weak. He didn't say the flesh is evil just said it's weak um, and then Psalm 139 most of us know it really well because we love it um, but we're fearfully and wonderfully made we're knit together in our mother's womb and uh, the Bible also tells us that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit and we're made in the image of God so I just want you to do a wee declaration for me I like audience participation so I'd like you to turn to your neighbour and I want you to say to them God loves my body Great, he does, it's true. He made it, he knows everything about it. Um, (laughs) um, (laughs) So, but the thing is that sometimes we're not great at looking after our bodies. So, I was thinking of some examples of people who haven't, who've done phenomenal things for God, but have not actually done well at looking after their body. So one of them, Amy Semple McPherson, if you've not heard about her, recommend you read God's Generals. You can hear all about her life. She did phenomenal things for God and moving and healing. Um, but she had an emotional and physical breakdown um, when she was 40 years old. It lasted for 10 months. Um, and her doctor basically said the reason that that happened was because she couldn't, couldn't get her needed rest. Um, And then Roland Baker, Heidi Baker's husband, Heidi who does Iris Ministries, he had severe dementia. Um, He didn't know his name, where he lived, he couldn't dress himself. And just at that time, they basically had over 10,000 churches. They were feeding 10,000 children and 10,000 adults a day. They had a staff of 1,800 people. And um, Heidi Baker actually read some stuff that she's written about what happened at the time. And she explains that prior to that, that uh, Roland lived in a, a, just a constant state of an anxiety and an inability to rest and relax and just weariness and stress uh, took over him and that he'd never actually been able to fully rest. They'd been missionaries for a long time up until this happened. And what she felt was that actually when he got dementia, that was like him getting the time he needed to rest which is quite strange, but thank goodness he got miraculously healed of that, which is phenomenal. And then finally, another guy um, is someone called Jack Coe, um, who, again, you can read about in God's Generals if you've not read it. He would um, often hold three meetings a day um, for four to six weeks at a time, and he just had really bad eating habits, um, sometimes having a full dinner at three o'clock in the morning, just such was his schedule. Um, and he was really overweight, and he actually died um, at the age of 38. Um, and Robert Slayardon, who wrote God's Generals, 
he, he has, says this really interesting thing, which I just wrote the quote down and wanted to read to you. Um, he said, The physical body is the only thing holding our spirit on earth. We must practice a healthy maintenance of our eating habits, mental attributes, and general well being. Otherwise, our physical house or bodies will break down and die. Then our spirits will have to leave the earth and go to heaven. If we fail to be good stewards over our flesh, our bodies die early and our spirits have to leave. Um, so what I wanted to do now, uh, I have invited a dear friend of mine up to talk about how, what actually our bodies need um, and how, how, we, how we go about um, looking after them. Um, so I'd just like to introduce the wonderful Kezia Merrick. Who's going to tell us um, what our bodies need. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Um, for um, those of you who don't know me, I, um, I love everything to do with being healthy. Um, and I'm passionate about living a healthy life. And um, I just kind of wanted to share a bit about some of the things I'd learnt about stewarding bodies well. Sorry, I'm just going to... Um, so yeah, like that quote that Jan just said about um, stewarding our bodies, how do we do that well? How, what does that really even mean? Um, I think first to, to look at that, you've got to think, in order to steward anything well, any area of your life, you've got to look at what it needs. Um, so you've got to look at what your body needs um, throughout um, time and weeks and whatever. And, and some of those things are sleep. We all need sleep. Probably when you were a student, you probably tried to not have sleep and realized that it didn't work. Um, you need rest. Um, we, we all need food. We, we all need to move in some sort of way and exercise. And things like light and air and oxygen and other, other you know, essential factors. And, then, and when, when talking about our bodies and talking about stewarding our bodies, often we can um, have the mentality of like our bodies sort of the secondary sort of lesser important part like our spiritual life is really important to develop and we're really good at developing you know the gifts of prophecy or evangelism or preaching or whatever but if our body's kind of failing or complaining then it's fine we'll just sort of drag it along with us um and i and i don't necessarily think that that's how god views our lives i think all of us are really important to, to him what we eat you know how we're getting on at work how we're feeling what our bodies are saying to us all of those things god really really cares about and and when i think about it like our bodies are the only thing that are keeping us on this earth you know your your body is something god ordained and god crafted that he has created in order to pour out good works throughout the earth your you know your body i like to think of it um as like your body is this transportation device for amazing world change. You know, you might have dreams of seeing every orphan in Africa housed and loved. That might be a dream, and you want to set up tons of orphanages. Actually, if your body isn't in a strong, healthy place, you're going to really struggle to do that. Or you might dream about preaching across the world and having a private jet and doing big crusades and seeing thousands saved. But if you're really unfit and you've got your body's kind of not really as good as it should be, it's going to be a struggle to see that happen. And so a lot of what I've realized is that healthy living isn't, and looking after your body isn't about vanity. It's not about some magazine or celebrity or faddy thing that you do. It's actually about um, preparing and stewarding yourself so that God's kingdom can keep on flowing through your life continuously and keeping on just going. You know, like, so when... The time comes when God shows up in the corner of the room and we're all like, whoa, God's literally there and we just want to worship for hours. That after the first song, you're not like, oh my goodness, I'm going to die. And then you're like, come on, the angels are here. I just want to party because God's so good. But really you're like, well, I'm just going to have to lie down and soak for a while because I'm exhausted. Or you want to you wanna preach and actually that's quite exhausting. Or you want to do acts of service or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so... I, I was going to, when I was preparing about today, I was just thinking of the questions of how good are we at meeting our body's needs? How good are we at um, resting and sleeping, eating well, and all these kinds of things? And, and how good are we at stewarding our bodies so that they proclaim God's goodness? So that people look at your family and how your family eats and your household and your energy levels and the fact that you never have a cold, like, and ask you why that is. People do that quite often to me of, why do you 
eat, like, why do you eat these weird things? Or why are you so passionate about nuts and seeds and vegetables? And, and, uh, and, I, it's, and I say to them, it's because, you know, it's because it's of, I want my life to be completely healthy because that's what God intended for us. He didn't intend it for us to be sort of half well and then just have to deal with it. He, our bodies are created by him to hold perfect health and to, to influence the world around us in that. So, um, and I think that the season that God is bringing us into is that he's just sort of taken us out of these boxes where we have allowed God to go. Like, you know, so we've allowed God in like church things and workplace and, and sort of our money as well. So we give God our money. But when it comes to eating and health, we're a bit like, well, surely God will um, just heal me and then that, that will be fine. Um, and I, and it, makes me think when I was preparing this of um I was reminded of the garden of Eden when God spoke to Adam and he gave him responsibility to name all the animals and in giving him that responsibility he gave Adam power and he gave Adam choices and I felt like that is we've got to remember that when we look at our health actually we have power and choices in relation to our health and actually um, I firmly believe that our bodies and our health are our responsibilities. Um, doctors are absolutely brilliant, and I thank Jesus for them all the time. But they're, they're not the ones that are responsible for your choices in terms of getting sleep, rest, food, exercise. You know, all those essential things, seeing the sunlight occasionally, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And stuff, sometimes sickness just happens. There is a mystery that, you know, we can't understand, and we don't know why. And... and some t- but a lot of it is coming back to the fact that we are powerful people and our health and our well-being is something we can make good choices about, we can cultivate. And actually, we can change the world through doing that. Like, how amazing would it be if people came into this church and were like, everyone here is so healthy. Everyone here is, like, slightly radiant with shiny hair and <laughs> they jump in worship for a really long time, like, longer than at my aerobics class. And, you know... <laughs> Like, how amazing would that be if people came here? Not only did they see the miraculous healings, which are going to happen, but they also saw people maintaining that miraculous, healthy living, not just in a moment, but for life. And we're creating families and workplaces, and everything around them was just being infused by God's desire for us to be 100% healthy. Um, and one thing I just wanted to quickly look at was, in terms of the things that we need, was eating. Now we all love eating. I, I do. It's great. I think we'll do it in heaven or earth or whatever happens. You know, we'll, we'll eat, I'm pretty sure, and feast, which will be good. Um, but I just wanted to challenge us um, as a family today was our, when it comes to eating, are we eating in a worshipful way? Because um, God loves every part of our lives to be worshipped. We have an opportunity for everything we do to be worshipped to him whether it's walking a dog, whether it's dancing, whether it's whatever it is. And, um, and God has just made so many amazingly good choices and provided so much good stuff when it comes to, eat, to food um, that will actually help heal our bodies. Like God, so God, we all know that God is a healer instead of someone who heals occasionally. So who he is is just a healer. So when he created the earth and made all these things that went on the earth, he made them in his image. So all these foods that he created actually I think have healing have the ability to help heal us and have the ability to change our lives and nourish us and and he's created tons of stuff so when we talk about eating often we think of healthy eating and are like oh that means I need to eat seeds and vegetables or I don't know rubbish food but actually God has created like he made stuff that grew in the ground, that walked on the ground, that swam in the sea, that flew in the air, that growed off trees, that, like, he created food everywhere. He loves food. He just wanted us to eat the right food, because that's what, you know, that's, that the food that he created has his healing properties in it to nourish your body and to flourish and allow you to change the world with his goodness and with his gospel. Um, so I don't, um, I, over the years, have come to the conclusion that I don't think eating is necessarily or being healthy and cultivating that is some sort of secondary thing to our spiritual walk with God but actually it's equal to developing your leadership gifts it's equal to doing what you feel called to do in church because it's part of our worship to him 
and it's part of how we'll change the world, is if when people as a body and as a family, we are this amazingly healthy place because we choose to partner with God with the miraculous, which we do and will increasingly do, but we also choose to partner with God in following his wisdom and his um, provision of the foods that he has already given us. And I think that is the key. Those two things are key to seeing this nation changed and seeing this nation no longer the sick man of Europe. It's through the miraculous, definitely, but then through the the maintaining the life of a miraculous making supernaturally healthy choices all the time that and trusting God's wisdom with food um so yeah I will I could talk about food and healthy thing for a long time but I'll hand you back to Jan thank you Thank you, Kezia. I'll just do a um, shameless plug on your behalf. Uh, Kezia has got a phenomenal um, a website. You can read her blog, supernaturallyhealthy.org, and she's also a coach. And if you need help to how to, how to manage what you eat, um, then she is a great person, actually, who asks really great questions about choices and uh, what to, how you're making your choices and what that looks like for you. So I'd chat to her if you need some help. Okay, so um, Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword dividing between soul and spirit and bone and marrow. And I've often read that verse um, in the past and thought, oh my goodness, like, let's cut out, like, like we have to divide soul and spirit because soul is good, uh, sorry, spirit is good and soul is bad. Um, and often we can, we can read it like that. But um, what's really interesting, there's someone called um, Harold Eberly, who's a theologian, and in his book, um, Escaping Dualism, he explains that in the Greek, it says that both soul um, is divided and spirit is divided. So actually how we could read this is that the word of God divides between the soul and the soul and the spirit and the spirit. In other words, the word of God is living and active and it can cut out what shouldn't be in the soul um, and leave in everything that should be. Um, and the same with the spirit. It's so sharp that it can take out exactly what shouldn't be there without touching anything that should be. Um, and 3 John 1, 2 says, I pray that you would prosper and be in good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul prospers. So what happens if you oppress your soul? Well, you undermine your prosperity and you could destroy your health. Um, Romans 8.14 says, All who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Um, and I think it's really important that we realise that spirit-led does not mean um, soul-oppressed. Um, I think often we can just really have, like what Kezia was saying, that we've just we've not been good at looking after and managing our soul in the way that we haven't had seen actually how beneficial um, maintaining a healthy a balance of our bodies actually that, that's the same we're not going to drag along our soul uh, just because we have to um, but actually it has needs um, as well and what actually can happen is if we become soul starved um, rather than getting our needs met proactively and healthily they get met reactively and actually that can just become dangerous and that the thing that we need can erupt out of us so for example someone who is drowning they have a desperate need. They need, they need air, they need oxygen. And so it's recommended that you do not jump in after someone who's drowning because actually they will do anything they can to get their need met, even if it means um, that they suck the life out of you. Um, so it's really important that we get to realize what our souls need. Um, so what do our souls need? Our souls need affection. They need attention. They need significance. They need, we need to feel like our life matters. Uh, and we need to be loved. And the other thing that's important is that we get a plan um, in place for how we get these needs met. Uh, so first of all, we all need to be loved. Um, and one of the things that I have found as a great tool um, for doing that is actually having a look at our love languages. Um, and what I think it's, the love languages are great for is actually just putting words on describing how you're wired. Um, which allow you then to communicate that need to other people. So it's not like, oh, this is, the, good, this is the, the newest thing. It's actually stuff that we already know about ourselves, but we just get a word for it, which enables us to communicate uh, that to someone else. So what I wanted to do just quickly was be run through uh, the love languages and what they are. So uh, the first one uh, is touch. 
So people who um, are touch people, uh, they have really, uh, this is, uh, I'm taking this from Danny Silk's book, Keep Your Love On. So Gary Chapman was the, the guy who kind of came up with the five love languages. So you could read his book, um, or Danny mentions it in Keep Your Love On. So he says that um, touch people have a touch meter planted inside their chests, which connects to every other place in their body like a nerve ending. The meter is counting the nanoseconds since they were last touch. A meter is depleted, as the meter is depleted by a lack of touch, it registers higher and higher numbers of need. After these numbers reach a certain point, a touch person feels anxiety increase and they can easily become aggravated or agitated, just like people who get grumpy when they haven't eaten. When a touch person is getting their touch need met, they feel safe, nurtured and loved and you will see them at their best. Uh, but starve this need for affection accidentally or intentionally and you'll get the worst person that they can be. The kind of touch that will fill a touch person's love tank must be healthy, respectful and offered as a free gift of affection. A touch person needs to learn how to be powerful in communicating his or her need because touch is most intrusive of per people's personal space and those who don't like touch often feel uncomfortable in meeting that need in others. Uh, the other one, another one, acts of service. They've also got a meter inside of them, Danny says. Um, it marks the ebb and flow of investments into their love bank through the currency of intentional acts of kindness. Each and every time acts of service people enter their home or work environment, the meter begins to run. The meter is connected to a video camera in their heads that scans the surroundings and fills or depletes the meter, meter based on what they have, see has been done or not done for them. So, for example, they come home the house, into the house, see shoes, backpacks, dishes, jackets, and other random items strewn on the floor. The dog needs fed, see that the TV is on, no one's watching it, and anything else needs to be fixed or done, their anxiety level begins to climb. The way to fill an acts of service person's love tank is to find out what they need and to do it as a free act of love, not coercion. Um, and so basically acts of love people, they need to feel loved when you take care of things that are important to them. Um, a gifts person, they are constantly soaking up evidence that the people in their life know them and think about them when they're not around. And this lies, this evidence lies in a physical token of love. The gifts person hears, feels and experiences love through the offering of a gift that says, I know you, I've been paying attention to you, I've become a student of you and this gift demonstrates that I get you. Um, and so anniversaries, birthdays and holidays would be an occasion to provide them with endless reasons for gifts. And they will have paid attention to what you like to do, what you like to eat, what you collect, where you've been in the world. And their gift to you will symbolize this attention to the details that they have, of the detail of your life. And they'll expect you to reciprocate in kind. Uh, a quality time person. They um, feel love and connection when you find them interesting and the evidence of this interest being that you want to spend time with them. When a quality time person invites you to have a conversation or to join them in an activity or a hobby, this is an opportunity for you to send them the message, I am interested in you. Um, quality time is not necessarily quantity time. The level of genuine interest and engagement you give determines quality. So if you engage in the activity or conversation with all your energy and attention, you engage with that person on the deepest level. Um, and finally, words of affirmation. Words of affirmation people feel most enjoyed and appreciated when your body uh, language and words include a positive tone of voice, facial expression and word choice. They notice the spirit of intent of the words exchange and that impacts them powerfully. A simple word of encouragement goes a long way toward creating safety and connection love flows into them with every positive word and they relax as they experience someone verbally enjo expressing their enjoyment in, in them or of them. So um, I would just encourage you, if that has not helped you discover what yours are, you can go online and have a, you can do a wee test. Um, and I just think, like, I was thinking about, like, oh, Jesus, like, what are his love languages? And I, th I think that if you look in scripture, which I did, I'm not going to tell you the most, that could be your homework. Uh, go and have a think about them. But I came up with, um, basically, well, the easy one, uh, words of affirmation. So Father speaks to Jesus at his baptism and again at the transfiguration. Um, and then touch, actually. So I reckon Jesus likes hugs. Um, he often hugs me when I have encounters with him, but he's like, let the children come to me. And kids love giving hugs. I think Jesus wanted a hug. And he, you know, John lay on his chest. We hear that 
um, we've heard that recently um, whenever he went, he's near enough to that Jesus could whisper to him and no one else could hear. Um, so I would be, I'm a, one of my top love languages is quality time. Um, and I've really had to learn to be vulnerable, have open conversation with friends where I have been able to express that I felt uh, rejected or unimportant if they don't make uh, time uh, in their diaries for me. Um, and now that they know that, uh, they prioritize that and my need uh, gets met. Uh, so they need to be loved. Affection, the next one. So um, just a quick look at... Um, David and Jonathan, they're an amazing example of a positive soul tie between two men. Um, 1 Samuel 18, 1 says, The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And later, we read in 1 Samuel 20, 17, Jonathan he loved him as he loved his own life. And then there's that whole you know, saga of is, D is Saul wanting to kill David or not? And they come up with that bow and arrow thing. I'm not going to read it to you, but you can read it in 1 Samuel 20. But in verse 21, uh, when he d David discovers that Saul does want to kill him, he says, uh, we read, David fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times and they kissed one another and wept with un one another, David weeping the most. Um, and then 2 Samuel 1, 26, when uh, David hears that Jonathan's died in battle. He um, writes a song, and what, he, what it says is, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was more wonderful than the love of women. Um, so this is, these are two warriors um, who basically know how to express emotion and affection. They weren't wimps. Their affection doesn't reduce them as men. Um, and they're really just demonstrating how to love one another with affection and passion um, of God. Um, and you know, affection was part of the early church. Um, so basically, I found five instances. So 1 Corinthians 16, 20, greet one another with a holy kiss. Romans 16, 16, greet one another with a holy kiss. 1 Thessalonians 5, 26, greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. 2 Corinthians 13, 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. 1 Peter 5, 14, greet one another with a kiss of love. And to know that there's a lot of people who are not whole, um, you know, we're talking about wholeness today, and there's a lot of people who are not whole because they're not getting their affection needs met. And, and often I, I think that that can be because churches can sometimes be a sterile environment. Um, but we really need to move away from the fear of touching people. Um, and thankfully, I'm so pleased for this one, uh, I'm so thankful that we have moved away from side hugs. Because they, to me, I was thinking, what, what, what are they like to me? And I, this, is my, this is what I came up with. To me, a side hug is like a limp handshake. When someone <laughs> reaches out for a handshake, they do nothing, and you think, why did you even bother? But <laughs> that's what a side hug is like to me. So thank goodness that we've moved away from that, and um, we're not fearful of full-on hugs. Um, but one of the things that I, I mean, I, I've lived in France twice in my life, and they are very affectionate you know, kissing all the time, people to greet them. Um, so I, and also I come from an affectionate family. So um, for me, I, I need to have not side hugs. Um, but what I love is, I mean, Phil and I just shared it so well earlier, but we've known each other actually for eight and a half years, um, which is quite funny and great because I have seen him journey through a lot and he's not the person he once was. <laughs> um, but what is amazing and what I really love and value about Phil is what a great brother he is to me, actually. And he does the very thing that my own brothers do. So he sees me and he greets me and he gives me a kiss on the cheek and a hug. And there's something really... Um, precious about that actually when you get affection from a, a Christian brother um, or a sister um, that it, it's basically it meets a need and I'm not saying right let's go around and hug and kiss everyone because you know <laughs> let's be wise but you know imagine a visitor comes in and they just get like slobbered <laughs> over and pounced on <laughs> And, and maybe like maybe touch is not even their love language. We want to be, we want to be white. Like just hear what I'm not saying. But I don't, I don't want us to withhold our affection, eh, because we're fearful of one another or impacted by stories of people who've had eh, moral failures. My heart really is that God would restore holy affection in our lives. And I actually want you to realise that affection meets a soul need in all of us. We all need affection, but we all really need to learn how to communicate. Uh, that to people um, that we're in relationship with. So I told you audience participation. So women, if you like the men in your lives to tell you that you are beautiful, would you put your hand up? If you like men to tell you you're beautiful, put your hand up. Okay, men, 
Would you, don't be frightened, nice and high women. Okay, so if you men look around, there are a lot of hands up across this room. So one of the things that women, this is not a sweeping generalization, but verbal affection is important to women. Um, and there is a difference between hearing a, a sister say, oh, Pam, you look beautiful. I love that color on you, you look great. There's a difference between me saying that to Pam um, and a, a man saying that to her. So it's just something about a guy or a man or a brother in Christ telling me um, that I'm beautiful, that it lands differently. It has a greater um, impact. Um, and so thankfully I've got a great father who tells me that and I have got fathers um, and brothers in this house who tell me that I'm beautiful but that is actually something that I have learned to communicate that is a need uh, that I have and I really do believe that there that, that we need mothers and fathers to tell us that we're beautiful and that we're handsome so if you're a mother or a father in this house I actually want to encourage you to start verbally communicating that to the sons and daughters uh, in this family uh, my own story was really one of being so starved, um, not because people weren't affectionate to me or loving towards me, but I really um, had basically my verbal affection tank had been depleted so that, um, and it wasn't being filled enough with go godly men pouring into me actually. So when, because I was depleted, um, it basically meant that it was, it was non-Christian guys who were filling that tank, which just left me really confused and with unhelpful heart connections um, but thank goodness I have learned that lesson and learned to communicate what I need um, and also as a single woman um, and for single guys too we need um, we need actually to have a, um, we need physical affection actually when you're single you do need physical affection from the opposite sex um, and I have got, a, as I said, a very affectionate, natural family, but I've, I am learning and having to learn how to do this safely with Christian brothers and uh, fathers, and also how to communicate that what I need to snuggle up with some guy who is a Christian brother or father, and that's okay. Um, and so I actually want to encourage you, like, ask God about it, chat to him. We, we all have different needs. Um, and the other thing that I... Um, what I just really don't, I was really thinking about this, and my heart is that, you know, there are lots of young people growing up in our family, and what is really important to me is that they grow up hearing that they are attractive, beautiful, handsome, um, and that physical affection is something that they get um, from people who value them. So I actually want to urge you, um, if you're a parent, to just really place a high priority um, in verbal and physical affection with your kids. Because the truth is that a culture without affection causes people to look for it in other places instead of healthy places. Um, in John 13, um, Jesus gave us a commandment to love one another just as he loved us. Um, and he said, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And what that means is that love actually looks like something. And I love imagining what it would have been like in the early church. So, you know, in Acts 2 and Acts 4, when we read about how they shared their possessions and there was no needy person amongst them and they were together and they shared and they were, I just think that sounds great. I would love to just be like a fly in the wall, see what that looks like. Um, but what I really, um, I was just thinking about in Acts 4, it says, um, what I would love to do is just add on to this. Um, and it says, those who believe were of one heart and soul, they had everything in common. There was not a needy person among them. What I would like to add is every one of them lived in wholeness, knew they were loved and could fully love. They received and gave affection and no one felt lonely. And what I would love that if we were able to say that about our family. Um, Psalm 68 tells us that God sets the lonely in families. And you know, people, it would be surprising actually if, if I were to ask, and I'm not going to for a show of hands, as to who has ever felt lonely. Um, in church before actually that that it is quite common um, and I just really want to challenge you to be open and vulnerable enough to actually get a spend time with people plan in place that um, you know my parents often laugh at me because I'll just I just say oh I'm just going to come home for dinner or I'm just coming over for two years for lunch and I just like invite myself over for a meal to people's houses now the reason for that is because I live on my own so 
actually, it'd be really rubbish if I ate on my own every night of the week. So I just invite myself in to other people's uh, meals, which is great. <laughs> and I do reciprocate. I do reciprocate. <laughs> um, and <laughs> Um, Rebecca and JL um, stood very courageously here um, quite a few weeks ago now and on behalf of the student group and they really just shared their heart um, of wanting to be invited into your homes and to do relationship with you and because they realise that building relationship with just their peers they have a lack actually because family is multi-generational um, and I really believe that there's more to life in the body than we've yet seen or are living. Um, I actually want to encourage you to explore what that looks like. Acts 2, Acts 4. Let me know. Um, and the more time that we spend with Father, the more whole we become. Um, so that would be, I would say, our priority. Um, we were designed to have a vertical relationship with him, um, first and foremost, our intimacy and personal relationship with our dad and heaven. That, that is really where we get our needs met. He tells us what he thinks about us we get his affirmation and we get to hear how much he loves us. But we were also designed to have a horizontal relationship um, with each other and actually with the God in you. And what I mean by that is that I need, I need the way that God flows through you to me. Um, actually, that he, he's designed us, that we need, one, we need to do one another thing. Um, and so, yeah, I, um, I need you. We need each other. We need to be in fellowship. In relationship with each other so we get our needs met horizontal vertically and horizontally um, so one anothering is vital and sometimes that can bring some challenges with it we're all very different um, I've asked permission to share this one but Johnny Andrew John up the back nice to see you um, he and I are very different if you know either of us uh, or both of us well um, that we are not at all like each other and actually some time ago we had to really take a decision um, as to whether we wanted to work on our heart connection or not and we had to really bravely communicate um, how we were receiving each other clear up some miscommunication some heart and really re-establish um, a good heart connection um, but actually the thing that I think drove us both the most is that our passion and love for Jesus for the thing that we had in common. And so we were basically prepared to work out our differences and step towards each other. And one of the things that um, I love that Banning Liebscher actually um, says is that our goal in conflict is that we come out with a more intimate connection um, at the end. And I think that that's probably what happened with us actually is we um, were just vulnerable and sharing our hearts about what we were finding difficult with each other and um, it's actually strengthened our bond which is amazing um, and something that Jo, jo Thompson uh, is from Edinburgh she shared um, at school um, on Tuesday night and I think it was her husband actually who said this but I just thought it was great and what she said um, is that when we don't value someone we're disagreeing with God who values them enough to die for them which is pretty profound um, uh, and the thing actually as well is that what can be quite challenging is that God will often hide the very thing that you need in the person that offends you the most. <laughs> um, and when Jesus walked this earth, he um, knew what his core values were. That allowed him to communicate uh, what he needed, get his needs met healthily, live in wholeness. He knew when to say no, he knew when to say yes. He knew when to withdraw from the crowds and invest um, in time with his disciples. He knew when to get alone with the Father. He knew when to eat, to sleep, to rest. Um, and he is just a great, great example um, of how to manage yourself in the face of need. And it is vitally important that we learn what we need to function. Um, so I actually want to encourage you to take time out with the Holy Spirit. Ask him, how are you wired? What makes you tick? What are your needs? Um, do you know if it helps do some of the personality tests you can get online and talk through the results with Holy Spirit about how you like how you're made how he made you how you function strength finders um, have a look at I mean you can go online look at core values narrow down what are your what are some of your top um, core values um, so that actually you know what what it is you're basing uh, your life on so for me one of my core values is adventure so I need to make sure that that need gets filled because otherwise I could be quickly bored and I'm not good company if I'm not getting my adventure need filled. So I do that by 
going away a weekend somewhere and some sort of adventure. So I'm going to France in a few weeks. That's my adventure for November. And basically by the time Christmas comes, I'll have gone 11 times. So 11 months out of the year period, I'll have been away once every month because I need that in my life to function. Um, exercise is also a core value that I have, fitness. So I schedule it in. Often people will be like, oh, do you want to meet up? And I'm like, well, I'm going to run 10K so I can... I can see you later, so I'll maybe meet them at half eight, then I've had time to run, shower, eat. Um, and I schedule in alone time in my diary, so I have Jan night written in, and if someone says, oh, are you free on this day? And I look and it says Jan night, I'm like, sorry, no, I'm not free that night. So I don't, I basically don't compromise. That's a need that I have to be time alone, just me and God hang out. Um, and so I would suggest an alternative date. Um, and just, I just want to, I really felt to hammer this point home. Um, so bear with me as I hammer at home. Um, but basically, if you're married, I really want to urge you that you need to get to know what you need, but you also really, really need to get to know what your spouse needs. Because um, actually, you know, God says that two become one. So you actually are, you're one, you're one whole. And if, if, if you're not knowing what the other one needs, then you're not able to fully function as that whole. Um, and your number one priority is God has said that already um, and he meets your needs first and foremost but second um, your needs are met through your spouse and then third would be I believe um, the body of Christ your family so and if you're not married then God's your number one and our family is is number two um, but I have just seen too many relationships where spouses either don't know what they need themselves they don't know what um, their better half needs um, and actually what happens uh, sadly is that they end up getting their needs met by uh, someone who's not their spouse um, a member of the opposite sex and they basically end up with ungodly soul ties and it creates, creates all sorts of mess so I just really encourage you make that a priority find out what you need and what your spouse uh, needs um, be vulnerable ask the question uh, the other thing I love is that Jesus uh, he didn't heal every single sick person that he saw he did heal all who came to him and he did do what the father told him to do he was he, you know he he only saw he did what he saw the father doing um, and so he knew how to manage himself in the face of constant need and my heart is that we would all know um, really what, what we need, we, we would learn how to get our needs met in a healthy way, that we would learn what it is to walk in wholeness, that we would know um, basically, yeah, what do we, what, how, how much sleep we need, how much rest we need, um, and, and how to get affection, how to get our love, how to get, how to get love from uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and do that in a wholesome way. Um, and the thing that I realized just in preparing this, I was like, actually wholeness doesn't just affect you and your body and your three parts because we're, we're made of three body soul and spirit but actually your wholeness affects the body and so actually if you're not walking in wholeness that's affecting me and it's affecting us um, and so I just really want to encourage you to um, you, you know you can only give out what you have and if you are sleep deprived that's not great if you are you know if you are affection deprived not great um and yeah, so I was just thinking actually like about our church family. Now that we've, for those of you who've maybe not been here very long, you wouldn't necessarily know this, but we've had over the many years that I've been here, a lot of prophetic words about the size of the church that we're going to be. Um, big foundations, big church, you're going to be a church of thousands, you're going to have all like the nations, all this sort of stuff. And just even recently when Julian Adams was here, he prophesied that we would quickly move to the six seven hundred mark and what i really want and i feel like this is preparation time in advance of what is about to come um because it's you know i've been harping on about we need to be ready we need to get ready what are we going to do if 700 people get saved and like you know like at pentecost people gather to noise what we're going to do if 700 people rock up in the car park shouting what must i do to be saved <laughs> <laughs> Uh, are we ready? I actually want to, I want us to be in the best shape that we can be. I really do. Um, that we know how to communicate our needs, that we get, are known how to get them met, that we 
we know when to withdraw and say, actually, no, I'm, I'm having a alone time. Me and God are going to hang out. I'm sorry, I'm not coming to this thing or whatever it is. That we know when we need to sleep or to rest and that we wouldn't, um, wouldn't burn out. So we, we're all called, I loved what Kez said, that he said, Kez said about being world changers. Actually, we are all called to change the world, but we're not going to do that exceptionally well if we are not functioning um, fully and wholly as God's intended us to be. So um, I just want to invite you to stand. I'm just gonna, we're just going to end there. If I have already um, asked you to be on ministry team, um, or if you serve with me on team at HSSL, could I just get you to come out now and stand, uh, just form a line? I'm just going to pray and then I'll tell you what we're going to do. Yeah, Father, I just want to thank you that you created us as triune beings, that you love and value our bodies, that you love and value our spirits, and that you love and value our souls. And so, Holy Spirit, we just invite you to, we just want to give you permission to teach us how to manage um, ourselves in the way that you intended, how to get our needs met, how to communicate that freely, and how to be brave, actually, in expressing, um, yeah, what we what we need to function. And Holy Spirit, we just ask, would you would you show us um, what we need? Actually, if we don't even know that, would you? I just want to ask that you would give us um, just a download of how we function, how we're wired, and um, yeah, just how you how you see us, what you love about us, and that we would get our needs met primarily by you, Father, first and foremost. You are the only one who can fully meet our needs. Um, and then would you help us to be brave and vulnerable enough to allow others to meet um, the needs that we have um, yeah, on this earth, actually, that in this family, that we would do um, brave communication, we would do vulnerable relationship, and we would do deep heart connection, that when people come in here, that they would say, wow, they, they must be Christians because they've got love one for another. Father, let that be let that be what people see when they meet us. And we just give you permission. Help us, Holy Spirit, to walk in the wholeness that you want um, for us, Jesus. You want it at the cross and we want to live it. And we just thank you for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. You're amazing. We just give you all the glory. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.